My name is Dr. Nile. I'm with Liberty Fund. I will uh, chair this session and we'll have about uh, 30 minutes for the keynote speaker and 15 minutes for the responders and then open it up for questions and I will introduce uh, each speaker uh, in turn rather than all in the beginning. So I'll start with, uh, with Terry Anker who's our keynote speaker and um, he's uh, the chairman of the Anker Consulting Group. Uh, and has served as an advisor and owner of several small uh, businesses, uh, including real estate, uh, retail, wholesale, distribution, service industries, public sector, um, and uh, currently is advising uh, many small businesses. He has a list of them here in front of me, but to read them all uh, would take uh, time away from, from his talk. Uh, Mr. Anker has also uh, a Bachelor of Arts in Speech Communications from Indiana University and a Juris Doctorate uh, degree in the School of Law from Indiana University uh, where he earned uh, the Dean's Honors. Uh, he's also been politically active uh, in the U.S. and in uh, Indianapolis uh, and has also uh, been involved with many charities uh, including being on the Liberty Fund Board. So with that introduction, uh, I look forward to uh, Terry's talk. Hello, everybody. My God, that's loud. Can you hear? Should I not use this thing? Should I, you, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. What's that? Not anymore. Not anymore. I know you're all deaf now. I, I just, I, I've never loved these things, so i got to find the right distance. Uh, what Doug was trying to tell you is that I'm the, the guy here today that's not an academic. Uh, you, you know, Barbara, I think, brings one of us in like a zoo animal, you know, to, to appeal to people. Uh, how, how many people in the room would claim themselves to be business people and have a number of employees? Okay, so there's several of us. Uh, right now, across 11 companies, there are just under 400 employees. Uh, they range from, uh, we have a newspaper group that has 11 newspapers. Uh, we have a brewery. We're just in the process of building our second. Uh, brewery because of all the weird restrictions on, on transporting beer across state lines in the United States. Uh, but my perspective comes from somebody who grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere in flyover country in the United States. And I found my way to success through competition, not through the pre uh, uh, preservation of, of uh, what I had, but through being given the opportunity to risk what I had being given the opportunity to be competitive with other people. You know, the, the, the uh, uh, thing today is called exodus versus incentives. And it talks about can enhance competitiveness to stop Europe, Europe's loss of many of the most talented and enterprising. And, and l let me uh, frame it uh, without uh, necessarily going to spreadsheets, although we can talk about some of that kind of stuff if you're just looking for it. These guys, I think, will give you a lot more data. Let's talk about what's happened in Indiana. Indiana is a, a state in the middle of nowhere of about 7 million people. Uh, 30 years ago, Indiana had a budget deficit of $8 billion U.S., uh, had a significant portion of its, of its pension funds for state employees that were unfunded. Uh, there were a variety of other uh, very significant problems in the state. Uh, it, it certainly was an agriculture state at a time when agriculture was, was waning as an important uh, business in the United States. It was a, a, it's a state that has enormous manufacturing job losses. Over the last 25 years, Indiana has lost the most jobs uh, through loss of manufacturing of any job or of any state in the United States uh, as a percentage of its population. And yet today, Indiana has a budget surplus. Indiana has one of the lowest tax rates in America. Indiana has a 1.9 percent unemployment rate for college graduates. 1.9%, that's the lowest in the, in the United States, which is stunning. How can that possibly be? Well, it's interesting. Indiana took it upon itself to be very competitive. It, it simply said, how can we compete with our neighbors? Illinois, uh, uh, geography it was never my strong suit, so I'll explain. We're surrounded by uh, other states that they, they call the Rust Belt in the United States, meaning manufacturing jobs uh, in an old school kind of a way. Uh, but we were essentially a, an insignificant con uh, uh, a state at, at, in a part of a much longer or larger op uh, apparatus around us. Illinois, to our immediate west, right now has about a $100 uh, billion deficit when it c uh, in pensions. 
the state is, is bankrupt. If it were a business, a receiver would be appointed to make sure that I didn't steal from my employees. You, you, you know, these, these uh, states have uh, spent too much and they've tried to protect their citizens to the, from, from competition. It was interesting, last year we were in, in Thessaloniki, uh, Greece, and, and uh, the, the conversation was about competition. You know, we got very exercised about competition, and, and it was an enormous room, and there was a stage, and so we got to get up and dance around and look very American, I think, probably. Uh, but what happened when the thing ended is that a number of people from the audience, especially university professors, said, well, that's fine for you, but you like competition. You, and I think it was the larger world of you Americans. And, and, and I understand that, and, and, and there was even uh, uh, allegations made that, that there was a, an element of sort of greed, of, of taking more than one could consume, uh, that this uh, particular uh, associate professor, I talked to him afterwards, was, uh, was saying. But, but, but I pushed back in that particular conversation and said, you can choose not to compete against me, but that doesn't mean that I have to not compete against you. And if it's not me, it'll be someone in India. And if it's not someone in India, it'll be a woman from China. Competition exists as a part of the human condition. The idea that government, and government is simply a reflection of us. We run for office, we get elected, and then we set out to do things. Uh, often the things that we do are to protect something, often to protect our own seat in government, protect the fact that we have advantage under a system that protects us. And so we create these rules and regulations that prevent competition. The reason we want to prevent competition is not to protect the large population, it's to protect the people that have advantage under the system as it presently exists. In beer, for example, we started a brewery three years ago, we sell all the beer we make. By the way, beer is a fun thing to make. It takes 14 days, you turn water into a semi-addictive substance that girls love. It's fantastic. Uh, but you have to go through enormous amounts of regulation in order to sell beer. Uh, you, well, I'll give you a great example. We bought a building in a historic uh, neighborhood. Historic in the United States generally translates into rundown buildings and nothing works. The toilets don't flush, the electricity is dangerous. They're just, but they call it historic because that's much nicer than calling it a dumpy neighborhood that no one wants to live in. And so we bought this, this building that was an old warehouse building with the idea that we'd renovate it. And, and the city was very excited that we were making this investment in this neighborhood. And it's worked out very well. We've brought dozens of jobs there. We've, we've opened a tasting room. Now there are other restaurants that are opening nearby because of this association with the beer. Uh, but the, the building had brick floors. So we were preparing to go through the inspection and we're installing the various components that are required to make beer. And an inspector from the city comes and says, well, you can't have brick floors. And we're like, well, when you ask us to buy this building, it had brick floors. And they go, yeah, but beer is a hazardous material. And I'm like, well, it was more hazardous for me when I was in college than it is now. But I don't think it's hazardous to spill it on the floor. But they shut us down, said we couldn't make beer until we fixed the floors. So we went into this historic building. Now we're fighting with the people who want to preserve the brick floors because they're pretty. And the people who think that if we spill beer on the brick floors that we're going to somehow, I don't know, create drunkenness in the water table, possibly, that, you know, that could be. I don't think anybody would complain, frankly, if beer came out of the tap. It would be unusual to brush your teeth that way, but I think we'd get used to it. Uh, but at any rate, so ultimately we epoxied the floors. We just covered the brick floors. Uh, and unfortunately, the real truth is, because I was politically active, I was able to put pressure on people to get the job done. I don't know what would have happened to other investors. You, you set your money aside, you're making payroll for the staff, it, 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 and then you say, we're not going to open for 12 weeks more than we thought. Any of you who are in business understand, if you, if you go from having an expectation that your money is going to begin to, re to replace itself you know, in, in three months or five months, you take that out and you've got to fuel that or people aren't being paid. It's incredibly difficult. This thing about uh, Indiana, I think, is an interesting one. One of the, uh, the ideas that popped into my mind it, 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 when we started talking about this, this idea of, of competitiveness uh, or incentives. Indiana is not immune to incentives. We have major sports teams, so we have these colossal cathedrals of sport 
that they build. Uh, the uh, football stadium for the Indianapolis Colts has a glass roof that opens, which is fantastic. But they open it once a year, and the roof itself cost $130 million to build this roof, which is just fantastic for the one day it's open. But it's interesting because when they open it, people complain that now they're in the sun and the air conditioning doesn't work inside the building. And I mean, there's just, but this was what you can do when you have a billion dollars to, to, to spend to incentivize a team like that to stay. There's not an NFL owner in the United States that isn't a billionaire now. That changed uh, just a few years ago. And there are very few of the team owners that have built their own stadiums. The stadiums are largely built through tax dollars. But that's not really what I'm talking about right now. It, what I'd point to, uh, Indiana recently attracted a, a large manufacturer of jet airplane engines. Uh, it's owned by a, a venture capital group called GE Capital, General Electric. Uh, General Electric uh, made the determination to put a hundred million dollar plant in West Lafayette near Purdue University. Perhaps you've heard of Purdue University. It's a, a place that's related to aerospace. Uh, most American astronauts, uh, the largest number of American astronauts, have graduated from that particular institution. Uh, well, at any rate, the state, I went back through and, and found out what did the state of Indiana offer to General Electric? All in, there's about $3 million of tax incentives, meaning that they don't pay taxes if they meet standards. So they don't get any money in advance, but if they don't, it, it, and, but they do get them if they grow jobs and pay taxes in a certain kind of a way. There's about $1.3 million that was granted to the local community to build sewers and, and high-speed internet connection points and these kind of things that the city of Lafayette didn't have to build, so they applied for a grant and they got it for the state. The state was going to spend that money on infrastructure anyway, but they set aside some for these kinds of incentives. And the final is about $300,000 of retraining. So in other words, they're, they're saying that if, if you identify employees that are working in an automobile manufacturing company and you want to teach them how to manufacture jet engines in this plant, we'll help you. So all in, that's about $5 million that, that they have to earn over time on a $100 million facility, I couldn't figure out how that made any sense. So I, I uh, uh, sifted through the reports and I talked to the, to the economic development officer for the state of Indiana that brought that group here, and he said, well, they didn't come because of any incentives. There were a number of other states that had pumped tons more money, more like 20 or $25 million into the deal to try to attract them. But they came because they liked the fact that the university was there. And I said, well, what do they like about the university? Is it because of the classes or because they think they're going to have access to professors? And they said, no, actually what it is, is that many, many years ago, Purdue University, back, uh, during the same period of Renaissance in Indiana, broke off uh, a group that started out licensing ideas that were coming through the university. So as opposed to university faculty members coming up with general ideas about whatever, a new wing design or something, and then it it uh, being written up in a dissertation and put into a stack and then never discussed ever again, the university made a, a very concerted effort to, to attempt to outlicense those technologies. Uh, over the years, it's become a very successful thing. Now there are dozens of companies th that, that generate hundreds of millions of dollars a year in revenue back to the university, but also generate this sort of an entrepreneurial mindset so that people can live in this small town in the middle of Indiana because they're competitive. Because now they're competing against Boeing in Seattle and they're competing against these other uh, uh, hubs, these other enormous businesses, but it wasn't funded by government. It was something that was sort of cast off from government. So in fact, rather than government being more controlling of the technology, government had to make a decision to allow this technology to be outlicensed. And the universities for many years, and I was involved in this uh, got 15 or 20 years ago, in attempting to get universities to consider outlicensing. The challenge was that they didn't want anyone except themselves to exploit the technology. They're like, we built it, so we're going to exploit it. Uh, you, you know, I could ask this question of all of you in the room who raised your hands about employees. Is there anyone that believes that government can make more money off your money than you can? 
And I always say this, when people, you know, I don't mind paying taxes, and perhaps I, I, I disagree with some, what I call them radical libertarian fundamentalists, you know, people that say there should be no government, there should be nothing, and Barbara, with all respect, I'm, you know, I'm okay with roads and a few things. We could pay for those maybe independently. But the problem I have is when government decides that it's going to be entrepreneurial, it's going to take my money and turn around and invest it. I'm proven. You know, for the last 30 years, I started with nothing, and I've made my way on my own. Government isn't. Government is a horrible reinvestor uh, uh, of my money. Government doesn't, uh, unfortunately, doesn't create a, 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 an environment where people can compete. Government, by its very nature, tries to protect people. And maybe that's a good thing. You know, secure borders and and uh, keeping Russia from annexing Indiana might be an important thing to do, although there are some of my fellow citizens who are willing to be annexed at this point. Uh, but my, my argument at the end of the day is that government can't compete. All it can do is allow us to compete. All it can do is allow each of us as individuals to, to reach into our own souls and determine what our ability is and what our willingness is to work a little harder, do a little more than this Chinese woman that I was referring to or the young Indian man who's, who's creating something right now that, that will compete and perhaps blow Apple out of the water. I was speaking to a group of uh, high school kids uh, last year and uh, I asked them how, how many of them had iPhones. You know, and they, 85% of them raised their hand. It's a ridiculous uh, sort of American uh, thing that everybody's got their phone and works it all the time. And I said, now, you realize that, the, that it's entirely likely that by the time you're a graduate from college and married, Apple will no longer exist as a company. And people gasp like they, they couldn't imagine what they would do. But I've lived long enough that I remember when Apple didn't exist as a company. It appeared. It competed. It found its way. Uh, and, and sadly, when companies get to a certain size, they begin to use government. They rent seek. They find ways to, to use government to their advantage as a weapon. I've often wondered if companies shouldn't uh, necessarily do that because it provides better shareholder value. You know, if I'm Apple and I can go to the community where it's headquartered and say, I want to not pay corporate taxes for the next five years or else I'm moving to a different city, as a shareholder, does that bring value to me? Well, perhaps. Uh, but on the other hand, what I'm more excited about is seeing Samsung compete against Apple. I'm more excited about seeing HTC compete against Apple. I'm more excited about seeing these other enterprises that we've yet to conceive that will compete against Apple that are occurring right now in places where competition is encouraged. You look at the uh, free market uh, Rocha website, Barbara, by the way, brilliant job this year. It's really very, very good. And just flip through the pages and look at where the, the various cities fall on unemployment and their competitive index or their free market index. The unemployment is lower in places that are more competitive. It's much, much higher in places that are anti-competitive. It's sort of a, a, it seems a, a confusing to politicians that they think that they can simply pass a law and prevent people from losing their jobs. That, that's what they should do, right? Pretty easy. But the challenge is it doesn't work. I was uh, reading uh, on the airplane over this morning, uh, you know, the in-flight magazine. Uh, you've heard of this actress, Selma Hayek. She's married to apparently to a French multi-billionaire. And uh, they are moving from Paris to London. And she was making a very emphatic point that they were specifically not moving to avoid taxes. Specifically, not moving to avoid taxes. So when I got here today, I spent a little time on the internet to find out if, in fact, her husband was moving his business interest. Guess what? He's moving his business interest. They're moving so that she can perform on the West End. I'm sure that her intentions are good, because why would she say it in the newspaper if it weren't, right? Uh, but the point is that even there, even in that sort of the Hollywood elite, the people who lead this charge, someone a few minutes ago and I were talking about the current mayor of, of New York City, you, the, the, there's a bubble around these people. You, you, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett will never, ever worry for money. Regardless of what their tax rate is, they'll still be able to be uh, uh, crushing to other competitors. 
What they're really trying to do, what these guys, these, these men uh, uh, of great means are attempting to do is to tax the innovators. They want to prevent the people that, are, that are, are just beginning to nip at the heels of Microsoft. Bill Gates is a smart man. He understands that the reason that he overtook IBM is because he was competitive. He was innovative. He was different from IBM. And so the reason that they advocate for some of these, these ridiculous tax schemes now is they simply want to close the door behind them and prevent anyone like me from coming in and competing against them. Henry Waxman, a, a, a longtime a member of the a, American political establishment uh, and congressman, advocated that the federal government should begin to make direct cash payments to newspapers because they were destined to fail, that, that they couldn't be competitive, it was impossible, and that in order to save the great tradition of American press, and what he meant, I think, specifically was American press that supports me, as a political figure, the government should simply just buy these newspapers or give them money or just run them, like they do with General Motors and Chrysler and a variety of other American companies that have recently been nationalized. We just don't call it that, but that's essentially what's happened. Well, it's interesting because during that same period of time, we started a brand new newspaper from the ground up. Now, seven years later, we have 11 newspapers. Every one of them is profitable. And we're doing it by competing. If the federal government had involved itself in preserving the status quo, we would never have been able to create those newspapers. The citizens would never be able to read those points of view, which are, by the way, much more libertarian-leaning, uh, much more personal responsibility-leaning. But the only reason that we're able to express that is because we were able to compete. But Doug, I think I'll pass it back to you and let everybody else talk, and then we'll go from there. So, thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple uh, uh, responders, panelists as well, uh, to uh, speak to this uh, general issue. Uh, I pulled some bios off the web on each. Uh, if they're uh, mistaken, I, I hope you'll uh, correct them uh, from what, uh, what I could find. But uh, our next uh, panelist here is uh, Bogdan Glavan. I hope I pronounced that right. Oh, good. Uh, he's a professor of economics and director of the Murray Rothbard Center of Political Economy and Business. I assume that's pretty free market oriented. Uh, at the Romanian American University, he's published, uh, among other places, in the American Journal of Economics and Sociology, Independent Review, the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, and uh, if you want to add more, that would be great. Thank you. So many. Um, my topic today is brain drain, and uh, Romania is one of those countries which is more uh, heavily affected by brain drain. And we used to complain all the time that our brightest minds are leaving the country, and we're searching for solutions. But the point of my uh, argument today is that we're searching for solutions in the wrong place and we are treating the problem as if uh, it is one of, uh, as if it is a management problem. While in my opinion we have to deal, we deal with a property problem. A property problem belonging to the human capital formation. Uh, human capital is accumulated in the same way physical capital is accumulated. That is through investments. We need to save and invest, sacrifice times, use resources in order to accumulate human capital. Human capital is used in the economy in the same way other forms of capital are used. Uh, that is, uh, they are asked, they are searched, and they are channeled in various directions uh, depending on uh, their uh, specifications. We cannot talk about human capital in general. We always deal with specific human capital. Um, there is no such a thing as 
uh, education in general, except probably for the first years of uh, studies, uh, primary education. Uh, but uh, except for this period, all the education is or should be uh, specific education. So the essential question um, the economic mechanism has to answer is what kind of human capital, in what amount, and at what price uh, do we need? Um, by the way, one uh, uh, very mistaken notion is that uh, the more human capital we have, the better. And now, of course, uh, the more Mercedes we have, the better. Or the more notebooks we have, the better. But the problem is that all these things, just as human capital, cost us money. And the economic, the economic question is, is it worth it? I mean, don't we, don't we have something else to do with our resources besides accumulating human capital? So human capital has a price. And uh, the big merit or the big role of uh, the market economy is to answer this question. What is the price of the human capital? Uh, what kind of human capital do we need? Otherwise, if we do not ask these kind of questions, if we do not have a mechanism to answer these kind of questions, if we are not concerned with these kind of questions, we will simply waste other forms of capital, physical capital and human capital also. For example, I feel that I'm wasting my human capital a lot in the current Romanian education system. Um, now, you see here, from an economic um, point of view, each individual um, is judging uh, the investment in human capital uh, similar to other uh, forms of uh, investments. And uh, also, the entrepreneurs start to produce um, educational services just like other entrepreneurs uh, produces cars, produce car or cars or uh, uh, notebooks. In a free market, competition provides incentives for uh, both uh, these uh, two categories to uh, make the right decisions, to make the right accumulation of human capital and to provide the right human capital as the, uh, uh, the market uh, uh, individuals uh, need. The big problem of uh, our uh, uh, time is that human capital, in fact, is not treated as, a, as an economic good. Um, and as part of this uh, uh, idea, we have a public uh, system of human capital formation, or we have the or we have the government playing the major role in the system of human capital formation, and the system works like this, and everyone knows how it works. Uh, all of us pay taxes. These taxes are collected and distributed um, to schools and universities. Um, in order to provide certain services, educational services, the quality of which uh, in Romania as well as in other countries is quite low, quite low. Um, all the Romanians know, but um, our visitors today probably not, uh, that only half of the graduates the high schools in Romania managed to pass the national examination test. So uh, I always ask this kind of question to my students or uh, to the people I'm talking to. Do you know any uh, manufacturer, do you know any company which produces, uh, for instance, cars, but half of them are without brakes? Of course not. It's absurd. But it is not absurd for the Romanian education system. It is the rule. We are producing failures. Uh,
Of course, now, the public education system makes mistakes in uh, the allocation of human capital because as Austrian economists have uh, showed a long time ago, uh, you cannot have uh, economic calculation in a public system. You have a huge problem of incentives in a public system. And as a result of all this, um, you have a chaos, basically. Uh, people who are not concerned um, with what they are performing, people who go to school simply because they are told to go to school, people who go to school just to receive a piece of paper. Before coming here, by the way, I'll uh, make a parenthesis here. Before coming here, I um, heard what could seem to be a joke, but in fact it is very true. Uh, we have in Romania a, a state agency issuing certifications for people uh, pursuing certain professional courses, um, uh, short-term courses. And um, um, a colleague of mine went to this agency to ask for the diplomas that we need to uh, release to issue to our um, uh, students for these courses, and uh, we wanted uh, 10, uh, 10 uh, if I remember correctly, 10 diplomas. We had only 10 students at that class. And the, the cost of these 10 diplomas was less than a leu, which, in my opinion, makes the diploma even cheaper than the money here I'm holding in my, in my hand. So 10 diplomas, yeah, 10 diplomas cost less than a level. Yes, which makes the cost per diploma like 10 bani, 10 cents, something like that. Yeah. So um, it's amazing. I mean, um, you consume more fuel, you consume more paper, paperwork. Yes, you consume your nerves in order to uh, just to get the diplomas that you need to uh, pass to your students. Uh, it's a typical uh, uh, fashion, it's a typical way in which the Romanian education system works. Now, we are coming to our central uh, question. The central question is that because of this public education uh, system, Transactions with human capital um, are heavily inefficient. And one particular uh, transaction concerns the movement of human capital. What happens when the um, beneficiaries of human capital, people that have accumulated human capital, people that went to courses and have received educational services, are choosing to leave the country? and to work in a different place. That is, to deliver their uh, accumulated abilities and expertise to foreign people. That is when we have export of human capital. Um, in any other field of the economy, exports are considered to be a good thing. I mean, <laughs> right? We always hear this complaint, we should have we, we, we need to export more, otherwise our balance of payments is, is miserable. Um, what can we do in order to export more? Let's subsidize the exports. Uh, but when human capital is concerned, uh, as far as human capital is concerned, the export of human capital is considered to be very wrong. And nobody really knows exactly why. Uh, I mean, the usual argument brought on the table is because we have less doctors in Romania, people uh, living in Romania have less, uh, have a smaller chance to be cured or to work with professionals. If we could uh, preserve all these doctors in Romania, then our health system will perform very well. Um, I think the argument is quite wrong because 
it assumes that um, the doctors, that is the human capital, has all the complementary resources to work with so that the health system um, eventually uh, produces uh, valuable services for the community. But in fact, the biggest problem of uh, the Romanian health system uh, are not the doctors or the fact that doctors leave the country. But the miserable um, uh, state of physical capital, the state of, uh, of the rooms, the beds, of the machinery, or the lack of it. So um, let, let's remember the, the age of communism uh, where uh, we had a lot of doctors. I mean, no one left the country, right? And still, the quality of the uh, health system was very poor, just like it is today. In fact, today it is higher only because we have uh, private hospitals. Um, so, uh, in my opinion, the main issue, uh, the main unfortunate consequence of brain drain or the exports of human capital is not, not that uh, we, run we run out of doctors, but that we're losing money because of it. Um, before explaining this, I uh, decided to put this uh, slide with uh, the so-called solutions that are intended to resolve the problem of uh, brain drain. And you see here all the agenda of uh, possible interventions, um, subsidies uh, concerning loans or taxes, um, various programs supporting uh, entrepreneurs, individuals uh, in various fields, and uh, so on. All these so-called solutions uh, aim at uh, solving what could be considered, when I told you at the very beginning, a management problem. I mean, they treat the problem as it is a management problem, as the as the solution is right there, we only need the right government to take it or implement it, or the wise guy in the government to take it. I mean, the solution lies right there. Everyone can, can see it. Our problem, uh, arguably, is just that we lack some uh, well-intended person uh, at the top uh, implementing the solution. In my opinion, the problem is completely different. The problem is, not, of course, not that uh, we, have, we don't have well-intended uh, uh, government. Of course, we don't. Uh, but the problem is a problem of property, not of management. And if all those solutions will be implemented, nothing will be solved. Again, um, during communism, we had all the engineers, all the experts, all the doctors, and all the specialists our education system trained, and still the economy performed very poorly. And um, to emphasize my, or to uh, bring an example, um, I give you um, uh, the case of football clubs as a case of private organizations that invest in human capital and export human capital and import human capital too and are making money of it. Um, what's the difference between football clubs and the education system, educational system? The difference is the property regime. The educational system is based on a public, public property, football clubs are based on private property. Of course we have uh, all sorts of private companies that invest in uh, the training of their employees. So, um, we are losing, we have a lot to lose from brain drain. What we lose are the money, or the taxes that we have paid in order to uh, support a failed system a system which 
actually provides incentives for people to leave. So it's an um, absurd system. Given that in Romania we don't have the material conditions, we don't have the demand, and we don't have the physical um, uh, capital needed in order to work with all the many specialists that the Romanian educational system produces, it is obvious that this uh, specialist will search for a job outside the country. They will go in those markets where their human capital can be productively used. Um, so it is uh, uh, obvious from an economic point of view that we have a brain drain. The only problem is that not that people leave, but that I and you and all the other people are losing money at this uh, uh, business. We are losing money. We are paying taxes for what? For training some people, for uh, educating some people, which after that will give nothing back to us. Because this is how uh, the public education system works. You know, a football player, when it is bought by a football club, the football club invest in it, or in, in invest in him, uh, after that they can sell it, or they can hire it for a long term, but they are very careful with their investment, so that they, cannot, they should not uh, uh, lose money. In the public system, nobody cares about our money. Because they're taxes, we have to pay them. We have we have no uh, n no other alternative. So uh, nobody cares about how the money is, it, it is used. Uh, what is then the correct solution for treating the problem of brain drain? Well, the correct solution, in my opinion, is um, complete priv uh, privatization of the educational system, which in Romania has occurred. To a certain extent, um, guess where? In um, the primary education, in kindergartens, um, in um, elementary schools, but not in um, uh, high schools or um, um, which represent the bulk of the educational system. So um, until we will have a private educational system in which parents and uh, children or uh, adults, they may be adults, I don't know, are free to choose, are free to channel uh, their money, are free to accumulate their own kind of human capital, um, we, will, we will always uh, face the problem of brain drain and we will lose money. Even in a uh, semi-privatized system, when the state issued vouchers and give the parents uh, a voucher, so, so we are, it is basically funded on taxes, still, if the schools will be, um, um, uh, will be private, but not state-owned schools, they will take care of um, uh, preserving their investment. So we'll have a higher quality education and uh, less to complain about people leaving the country. So that is all, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, next we have uh, Dr. Radu Nikita, uh, who's Associate Professor at, uh, I'm definitely going to mispronounce this, I think, uh, Babe Balia University? Uh, how badly did I do? Ah, okay. Sorry. Thank you. Um, and, and here in Romania, and uh, where he teaches economics, uh, he was previously a teaching assistant at the Paul Cezanne University in Aix-en-Provence. <laughs> And um, uh, he received his PhD in 2002 for a work on deposit insurance. Uh, he's an associate scholar with uh, IREF uh, and president of CISED, a Romanian think tank uh, that pr uh, promotes economic education. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you for being here. and. Uh, 
please consider my uh, presentation as a concluding remarks because many of the ideas I wanted to present you were, uh, were already presented. So uh, I would like to talk about Exodus, about competitiveness, and about incentives. Uh, first of all, the decision to leave a country depends not only on uh, condition right now. If you lose your job, you won't quit your country. The decision to, to, to leave your country depends on uh, your expectations, mostly. Uh, the fact that many, so many Romanians, for example, left the country is a huge slap uh, on the face on, uh, of all the political class. Uh, we are talking about 10% of the population. 10% of Romanians left the country. Uh, I think the figure is a, bit, a little bit higher uh, because uh, they have no hope anymore to, to, to build a future here. Uh, of course, uh, it's, it's voting with the feet against our political class, but uh, this doesn't mean that uh, leaving our country to Italy or uh, Spain, it's a vote of absolute confidence uh, in uh, political class, uh, Italian or S uh, Spanish political class. Because uh, we, we can't conclude that if Romanians go to Spain and Italy, uh, everything is perfect, Spain and Italy don't uh, need to reform themselves and so on. We, can conclude maybe that they were liberated by Americans or they are doing a little bit better than uh, our political class. Uh, so it's, it's an asymmetric uh, analysis and rating of, of countries. I would like, uh, referring to the previous presentation and the title of, uh, of uh, this panel, that we should be aware to uh, not fight to, to, to not help this superstition uh, presented always by a socialist that people belong to the state we 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 don't belong to the state if someone wants to leave the country uh, this is uh, his right and even if uh, the state or the government or taxpayer invested money in uh, in my uh, in my uh, I don't know, my school my education uh, they don't have a real right on my life. Uh, when a football player is bought by a, a club, there is an explicit contract. Uh, I don't have an explicit contract with my, my government. Uh, and even if we, if we have uh, a contract, a government broke uh, all the contract uh, they, uh, they, they can. Uh, so people don't belong to the state even if government are saying so. Uh, for example, in France and even in the United States, if, if I'm right, they are trying to, to push and to, to invent new exit taxes for people who want to uh, remove their businesses uh, and their fiscal, uh, their fixed, uh, fiscal uh, dom uh, domiciliation uh, abroad. So uh, there is a problem there. Uh, governments understand that, starting to, they are starting to understand that there is a huge problem and they are trying to block this process. Uh, we had a kind of exit tax in communist Romania before 89. We, uh, we use uh, we had a, a very good export pro product, Germans, from a German minority in Romania, and the Jews, uh, they wanted to leave country, and we taxed them, uh, Romanian government taxed uh, them, actually uh, Germany and Israel, uh, and the argument was, oh, we invested in their education, and we had different rates uh, according to the diplomas uh, they, they had. So it's a, it's a very dangerous idea and, and uh, to, to present uh, the exodus as a loss to the government or something because it only uh, gives uh, arguments to, to socialists. Uh, of course, there are losses when uh, wealth creators uh, the most talented and entrepreneurs uh, in, in a people from, from, uh, from a country are leaving that country. Uh, but there are losses also for them. When, somebody, when someone leaves a country, 
uh, it, he faces huge losses. It, it's it's very difficult. I spent 11 years in in uh, in, uh, in in foreign countries. I know how difficult it is to integrate, to to have friends, to 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 learn a new language, a new culture. It's difficult, and you you will you will never be a part of that. Uh, only maybe your children. And people are emigrated, especially for their children. Uh, and of course, there are losses for people who are uh, staying, who are remaining in that uh, state. But it doesn't mean that we have the right to block them to leave. Uh, I think also that losses from an exodus are underestimated because uh, we are not talking only about uh, entrepreneurs who are living. We are talking about, for one entrepreneur who, are, who is living, how many, how many were uh, discouraged to become an entrepreneur and staying there? How many entrepreneurs are uh, broken up by, by, by regulations or by taxations by the state? So uh, it's very, very difficult to, to, uh, to evaluate all the, the losses of uh, this, uh, this process. But again, these losses uh, are, can't be transformed in an argument to, to block this exodus. Uh, speaking about competitiveness, you know that uh, there is at least two uh, international reports uh, trying to define, to evaluate, and to rank uh, countries according to their competitiveness. Uh, one of them is the World Competitiveness Yearbook, and uh, they are defining competitiveness uh, as something, uh, an environment uh, which helps to create prosperity to that people, and somehow it's a government responsibility. Uh, the definition uh, of a global competitiveness report is very similar. But I think the idea of uh, government, a uh, country, uh, country competitiveness is a very dangerous one. And uh, guess what? I think you would be very surprised uh, to find me uh, referring to uh, an economist known as Paul Krugman. I'm talking about the economist Paul Krugman and not the uh, New York Times uh, journalist. Uh, he said that uh, competitiveness, when uh, this word is used uh, to talk about a country, is a very, very dangerous word. And I, I, uh, I agree with him, uh, but not necessary for the same or only for the same reasons. Uh, I think it's a dangerous concept because it it opened the door uh, to uh, statist and, uh, and, and uh, communist and socialist uh, ideas. Uh, the idea uh, that uh, the government has some job to do and a country is like a, like a business, like a company, uh, it was actually an idea uh, presented by Lenin. He wanted to run a country as a, as a company, and it's wrong. Uh, this, uh, so, If, uh, if we have to speak about competitiveness, maybe uh, we should talk uh, of s something else. For example, Krugman recommends to use productivity, to rank uh, countries according to productivity. The most important factor uh, on which depends the, the prosperity of countries is productivity of each specific uh, country. Uh, but I think it's more important to talk about what stimulates productivity and we all knew, and I won't insist on, on that, that uh, maybe economic freedom has something to do or uh, the ease of doing business. You know, I'm sure, that there is a report uh, elaborated by uh, World Bank uh, ranking countries according to the ease of doing business. So we, we, should, uh, we should prefer, I think, to talk about specific uh, things like economic freedom and not something very general and very, very dangerous because it's easy to be distorted like competitiveness of a country. And uh, when we talk about uh, economic freedom, uh, or uh, we, 
we find the concept uh, of uh, institutional uh, competition. Uh, Barbara Col Col uh, uh, said something about about it. And we must understand that exodus, it's a symptom. It's a symptom of differences in economic and social environments. And com uh, when, when we try to fight against uh, exodus, actually we are trying to combat a, a, a symptom and not, uh, we are not offering a cure. And uh, the very possibility of exodus, the exodus is a form of institutional competition because it's an opportunity for individuals. It was very difficult to leave, uh, to leave Romania before 89. Uh, we, we didn't have a brain drain before 89. It doesn't mean we were better than today. Uh, it's it's uh, the last protection against political uh, excesses and actually the secret uh, of Europe's uh, taking off uh, we had, we used to have an institutional competition in Europe, and actually it helped. Uh, it helped, uh, uh, it, it consisted in innovation in technology and also innovation in institution. We discovered, uh, uh, by, almost by accident, the protection on, of individual liberty, and it helped to protect individual liberty thanks to that institutional, institutional competition. Uh, Europe had the, uh, the chance to be uh, politically uh, and economically uh, fragmented. Uh, it helped uh, wealth creation and uh, actually uh, this explanation of uh, European prosperity uh, is, uh, is facing a serious threat. We ha I identified at least two of them. Uh, one is top-down political harmonization, and the other one is the rational ignorance of the median voter. So, basically, uh, harmonization in uh, European uh, bureaucrat language means uniformization. You make things one size fits all. We we have a different way to understand harmonization, uh, like making uh, differences uh, compa compatible uh, one uh, with each other. Uh, we, uh, we had a lot of case study, for example the VAT, you have rules, uh, even if taxation is something uh, 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 which belongs to uh, national sovereignty, uh, VAT, we have VAT, VAT rules at the EU level, we have uh, a lot of discussions, more or less uh, uh, secrets, uh, and uh, about the common corporate tax base. They they want to, to harmonize this. Uh, you have uh, European directives on savings uh, and uh, and taxation. Uh, you have uh, privacy rules and and so on. So, I think this is a uh, this is a very serious problem, and. Uh, of course, for a libertarian, it's very obvious this, and the, the most dangerous uh, harmonization is when uh, it's, come, it's coming in very attractive packages. You know, uh, European, uh, European Commission, as a PR operation, wanted to, to, uh, to, uh, may, to, to install a ceiling on, on roaming, to, to lower the tax of roaming. Of course, uh, it had a bad, uh, bad consequences on uh, different rates, on internal rates, uh, of taxation, of communication. Uh, and anyway, it, sometimes it's very difficult to find the, the, the bad consequences of, uh, of regulation. But when a uh, uh, top-down harmonization comes uh, in attractive packages, it helps to promote this idea of, uh, of harmonization, which is... Uh, probably uh, re really dangerous. Uh, in, in Europe we had some, uh, some institutional competition and it worked uh, quite well, maybe because uh, kings, princes and emperors had a better incentive to take in account bad consequences of uh, bad uh, or well-intentioned policies. Uh, the incentives are very different in, uh, in uh, our uh, representative democracies because 
uh, the median voter uh, don't, uh, doesn't face the same, uh, the same uh, structure of, uh, of benefit and cost in taking a bad or a good decision. We, ha uh, we, are, we are living in, uh, not only in uh, representative democracies, but also in highly redistributive uh, democracies. So people don't face consequences of their bad vote decision. So we have, we have this kind of problem. And uh, we are familiar in uh, criticizing uh, political class, especially in Romania. We don't like uh, the political class, the politicians in general. Uh, but the political class is a mirror of the median voter. So uh, we, sh uh, we share, as a people, the same level of uh, economic education, of lack of economic education, as uh, the political class. Uh, or in some countries, like, like in France, for example, we have a very good level of anti-economic education. So, we, we are talking about incentives. We, it would be nice if we could change incentives on politicians. And exodus, if we, we remember, it depends on incentives, but also of uh, incentives are depending on institutional framework. And uh, the question, the real question is how to change this institutional framework. And uh, this, uh, uh, this exodus has uh, represent a, a kind of limited, but it, it represents an incentive for politicians to change to improve the institutional framework because it shows that something is wrong in your country when people are leaving. So we have an incentive, but it's a very limited one. Uh, the paradox is that reducing barrier to exodus, so making exodus more easy, would uh, increase incentives to poli uh, for politicians to, uh, to, to improve institutional framework. Uh, how can we change if we can change uh, incentives on median voter to, to, to be a better voter, to be a smarter voter? Uh, well, it depends if uh, it depends on his understanding of the cost and the benefit of, uh, of, uh, of policies. He must understand them. He must uh, so we we have we should have. A higher transparency in taxation, a higher transparency in public spending, and knowledge in alternative policies. And in in one or two words, it would be a better economic education. As you guess, I'm a, I'm a professor of economics, so if you need help, I'm here. Uh, uh, so uh, maybe I have a, there is some bias in in my explanation. Uh, but even if you understand the consequences of a, of a policy, uh, you you need an, an, another uh, ingredient. You need responsibility. Is the key element. Is the most. I think it's even most uh, more, more difficult to have the responsibility. We we sh in order to have a better responsibility, we should redesign safety nets. We should redesign taxation and redesign. Uh, redesign regulation which is which is quite quite difficult so uh, what's happening right now we have good bad and ugly news uh, the transatlantic trade and investment partnership discussions are good news the fact they are uh, not advancing very fast is bad the Swiss referendum of on uh, immigration in uh, Swiss uh, blocked actually uh, exodus <laughs> from France and Germany and uh, Romania and Bulgaria uh, to Switzerland. So it's not a very good news. Uh, the result, uh, elections in France, uh, elections uh, in France, we had a very low uh, level of uh, extreme right parties, but the themes anti-immigration themes of uh, uh, far right are confiscated by, uh, integrated in, in mainstream uh, political party. 
And Germany ha uh, has now a project against welfare uh, tourism, which is a step in the direction of redesigning the, uh, the safety net. So maybe uh, it could help. Uh, so I was told that there will be some uh, wood, uh, some politicians here or uh, potential politicians. I try to I try to identify uh, some strategies for benevolent politicians at local, national, European, and international level. And I will stop here because my time is already finished. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you to all the speakers for uh, keeping to the time. I want to give uh, the audience some time to ask questions. We have uh, an interesting topic before us from incentives in general to emigration. Uh, and so I want to open the floor up to, uh, to all of you. Rado, because you are an economics professor, looking at the migration, the macroeconomics is very, very much positive, and there are lots of evidence. So, of anything, you know. So, uh, as far as I remember, the, the last survey we did, it was sort of empirical, with. Uh, with groups surveyed, you know, in, in the countries, Bulgarians and Romanians, because the countries are roughly the same, uh, were going to, and as far as I remember, in, it was before the formal entry into the European Union, uh, as far as I remember, the remittances of uh, Romanians to their relatives at home were at the level of uh, like 5 to 6 percent of GDP. And they were financing in 2005, they were financing like uh, 400,000 annual incomes. So average, no, not, not the minimum wage or whatever. The same was roughly in Bulgaria, but the, the, the remittances were less in terms of GDP. Uh, then you have people immigrating, you know, obviously those who emigrate, those who go to Spain or Italy, uh, are obviously those who are not so well off, you know, here. So then the GDP per capita is growing, you know, the productivity is growing, everything is, is a positive. Why the issue? I mean, what's the problem? Is there a political problem in Romania about this? About, about, about immigration. emigration or immigration? Immigration. Immigration. Uh, on, so not on the other side of the end, you know, it's the same. I mean, if you look at the economic impacts on Spain, Italy, whatever, Germany, UK, France. You know, it's, it's, it's again positive, you know, it's, it's, it's very obvious. Uh, of course, uh, you, you have, uh, we, are, we talked only uh, especially about, about the cost of uh, uh, exodus, of leaving the country, but you have also benefits. Uh, for example, in, in uh, emigration uh, from Romania was especially from the poorest regions. Many, many people who lost their jobs, uh, they left the country, and in a way it, it was a, a lower pressure on, uh, on uh, social safety net. So it, it was a, a natural way of uh, solving uh, transition uh, adjustment problems. So. It, we had some benefits on that. We, we had all the uh, remittances, but the longer they are staying outside, the lower are remittances. In the end, some of them will decide to stay in Spain and they will send less and less money. It's, it's a natural phenomenon. Uh, in, the same, in the same way, when, when they go there, most of them, they are not going. They are not going for welfare, to, for welfare benefit. They are going to, to work in, in, in very very bad conditions. And uh, if they are finding some work, it's I think it's good. It's for it's in the interest of uh, those economies. However, we have the same problem as uh, like like in uh, in uh, in politics. We have uh, concentrated costs. 
and uh, very dispersed uh, benefits. When someone is losing a job in Germany or uh, in Spain and he sees that a Romanian or a Bulgarian is hired, he will see it. He will see that he lost his job. Someone took his job. But he won't see that the prices, for example, of, of houses is lower because the Romanians and Bulgarians are, wor are, are, are working in some in building sector. So the, I think this is the reaction, uh, one, one explanation of the negative reaction, because people uh, see uh, the, the concentrated costs of immigration from their point of view, and they don't see the benefit. Uh, always, uh, the, a second explanation, always the foreigner is a very good candidate uh, to the role of a, a, a scapegoat. It's, it's easier for politicians, for, for everybody, to say, oh, it's because of uh, foreigners. Uh, so uh, it's a reason to postpone reforms or uh, to explain the, I don't know, the deficit of uh, health uh, care system or uh, uh, the lack of uh, houses, not by uh, zoning regulation, not by uh, the, the statist or communist way of, of running uh, the healthcare system, then, uh, <laughs> then, then to find someone to blame for a foreigner especially. So at least two reasons. People don't know. They, they lack information, they lack economic education, they don't have enough incentives to inform themselves. The general complaint is that the skilled individuals are leaving the country, not the unskilled. And the level of remittances is associated with the unskilled individuals. So yes, we have millions of unskilled individuals who go for work in Italy or Spain and they uh, bring back or send back in Romania billions of euros. They used to send billions of euros before the crisis. Um, from this point of view, there is an obvious positive effects uh, for the rest of us living here. Uh, and I will give you another reason for, for this positive effect, namely that uh, this emigration keeps the unemployment rate depressed, and therefore the state spends less money with the unemployed people. But the general complaint is that the skilled individuals are leaving the country. These kind of individuals, the white collars, do not send so much money back here because they're living for good. They're not living just to work one summer there uh, 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 in order to keep their families alive here. They're living for good. Uh, so the issue remains, in my opinion. And the big loss still is that uh, with, with their living, we're losing the money we, we, we paid in order to educate them. I would like to address a question. Uh, to Mr. Terry Anker. First, I would like to make a comment on his uh, on his presentation about Be nice. yeah <laughs> about uh, competitiveness. And uh, what I can say is that this is, I believe, the driving force to boost our economy and to make an impact in our society. To 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 start uh, acting on policies which are stimulating innovation, R and D and it can be done only in a competitive environment. Without compet competitivity, there is, no, uh, there is no progress. And it's not just about the surviving of the fittest, but it's about values, because as, as a Christian Democrat, I am, I am uh, reading from the scriptures that St. Saint, Saint, uh, Paul said that uh, people who are not working, they shall not eat. So, uh, on the one hand, we should take responsibility for our actions and uh, innovation and development uh, lies on our personal responsibility. And uh, I have a question for you. What is the brand of your beer? Because you mentioned it and actually it's, I would like to try it because I heard that uh, beer from Indiana is quite good. 
Uh, I, I'm sure we'd both be promptly arrested if I mailed beer to you. <laughs> There's got to be dozens of laws that would be violating, but it's called flat 12, which is a, an engine type. Uh, you, you know, one of the things that, that have been mentioned that, that, that I, I could comment on just briefly is incentives are just as dangerous as disincentives. You know, we use taxation as a disincentive, but I become incredibly concerned when any of us say government should incentivize whatever because it's just a very dangerous thing to do. Entrepreneurs do not need to be incentivized. My wife spends enough money that I am busy every day. You, you, you know, we're engaged. I know what to do when I wake up. I don't have to have government say, I wish you would go do this. We've got plenty to do. I've got two sons. They're trying to figure out what they're going to do in the world. They're incentivized enough uh, as long as no one creates a place for them to rest. Uh, Indiana is many things that it has going for it. Uh, there's a, a, a conversation right now about minimum wage in the United States. If you are uh, uh, earning minimum wage, working at a call center, for example, that I own, uh, you're making, as a single person, about $4,000 above the poverty line, which in the United States is about $11,500. So the, the federal government believes you can live. However, the government of Indiana has decided you need $20,000 to live. So they'll pay an unemployment more than minimum wage. So what does a business person do? I raise the wage because I got to get employees. So now I'm paying 30% more than minimum wage or 100% uh, more than minimum wage, uh, which means that I can't hire anybody who's under 30 years old because I'm not gonna pay twice minimum wage or twice the going rate to get somebody that doesn't have any experience. So these college graduates that are coming out are refusing jobs thoughtfully, rationally, as economic actors. They're saying, I'll refuse that job because I can earn more on unemployment for 99 weeks. And the rule in Indiana is you had to have made $1,256 in the previous six months, which is virtually impossible not to do in the US. In order to, to draw an employment for over three years at 400 bucks a week, which is uh, significantly more than minimum wage. It, it, it's, it's interesting because in those particular instances, I'm directly competing with government. And they're saying, well, pay more. And I say, I will, I am paying more. You know, I'll, I'll pay more, but I'm not gonna hire the same person at that higher rate. And so unemployment among youth goes up. So then the, the solution is, well, they should be more educated. If they were simply more educated, if they spent more money for education, they'd be more valuable. No, if you've never worked anywhere, you still have the same value to me, which is you've proven that you can, you can stay in college, which is fantastic, and I, I value that. On the other hand, you may or may not have any skills that I need in order to have you as an employee. Skills like, do you show up on time? Do you show up every day? It's, it's stunning how a real job is just way different than going to college. You, you, you know, in a real job, I, I, I truly have had employees say that, that, they don't say it to me anymore because I don't really interact with them, but say, you mean I have to be here like every day at the same time? Yes, every day at the same time. It's, a, uh, it, it's an interesting uh, paradox that by attempting to provide more, government has actually taken away opportunity from the exact people that they're attempting to give opportunity to. Incentives don't work is, I guess, the point that I'm trying to make. Thank you. Hi, again for Terry Anker. Uh, you mentioned at some point that your home state, Iowa, I think. I Indiana. Indiana, sorry. More or less uh, the same. It's, you know, people don't know. <laughs> sorry, sorry about this. I, I, I feel for anyone, the Romania, Bulgaria thing, you know, that's going yeah. on, I totally feel for you. No one in New York or Los Angeles has any clue where I live. Okay, okay, so in Indiana, uh, you mentioned at some point that the state was nearly broke or almost broke, uh, but then they turned things around. What were the key measures that have made it so? Sure, there were, there were two primary things that, that, that happened, but they all stem from something that came out of the last session, which is a single word, which is will. The state of Indiana suddenly had the will to do two things. Reduce the cost of government that we already had, 
In other words, make it more efficient, improve the value of it, make sure that we were doing things that people cared about. The city of Detroit recently filed bankruptcy, and one of the jobs that the, the public employees union is fighting to keep is the city horseshoer. They haven't had a horse in 70 years, but they have a horseshoer. That job has been filled over and again. Uh, this, the city of Indianapolis had uh, people that did, mis uh, that did uh, housing inspections, so for private homes. I looked in the phone book at the time that we were considering that regulation. There were a thousand companies in central Indiana that did housing inspections. They were all cheaper than what the government would provide it for. And so I went to the supervisor and said, why are you defending this job? And he goes, well, Joe is a really nice guy, but, and I said, well, why don't you move him over to one of the other departments? Oh, he's a horrible employee. Nice guy. So can't we just keep that job until Joe retires? And the answer is no, you can't. You can't keep that job until Joe retires. Joe needs to be absorbed into something else or, or, or Joe needs to go and find a new skill. So number one is reducing expenses. The, the, the second is truly, and it's so hard to say this, but it's up behind me, just reducing the burden of individuals in trying to find a way to make money. Uh, regulation. Uh, and I'm not talking about, you know, let, let us you know, dump chemicals into streams or set babies on fire or any of the things that, that when we start talking about reducing regulation, I'm talking about a two month long battle that one of our companies had over the color of green that the sign used. The inspector had come and said, you can use these 10 colors. One of them was green. So, I mean, I have a notion of what green is. I'm not colorblind. I mean, I'm an adult or whatever. So we picked a green and we designed it and put the sign up and the inspector came out and said, I didn't mean that color green. They didn't like that color green. Now the good news there is we had newspapers so I was able to kind of put some pressure on them on the other side, but how ridiculous. And, and so the, 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 the idea that there's regulation so that you don't have signs everywhere, I get it, but the way that, that regulators reinforce their jobs so that they're busy all day long, so that they never have to, to, to justify what they do is very frightening. Uh, I bet if uh, Mitch Daniels, who was governor of Indiana during this period that I'm talking about, has recently be, become the president of Purdue University. The last three years in a row, he reduced the cost of living in a dormitory at Purdue University. Services remain the same. And so when asked by the media what he did, he just said, we were charging too much. We were charging too much. They, they found savings like any business person was, would, but instead of putting that money in his pocket like I would do, they simply just gave the money back so that families didn't have to borrow as much money to live in that dormitory. As you can imagine, the faculty and the, and the, the, the people who are, are deeply vested in making money off government are just livid, so angry that he would dare say that they were charging too much. Thank you very much. A, a brief comment on Bogdan. You said the qualified labor is causing some sort of a nervousness among the average public that they leave and that sort of stuff, but the economics of the Met is basically the following. You have a very high qualified person. If he or she is unhappy, or is not employed, then uh, the human capital is depreciating. So at the end of the day, you know, it remains unutilized. And sooner or later, because of the depreciation, there will be an additional cost of the system to retrain that person or the businesses, you know, who would hire those persons. You know, it will be an additional cost. So the, the uh, overall efficiency and productivity is falling down. So the economics is very clear. Question, one for uh, Terry and another one for Bogdan. Uh, what about uh, collaboration? 
to compete to compete it's okay but what about collaboration because you already mentioned something about a partnership with the, the state and things like this and the second question um, as i understood bogdan it's uh, involved in a romanian private uh, university if uh, he has some figures regarding the graduates and uh, a percent of the graduate that they found jobs after graduation. Thank you. Uh, collaboration for, for, to be competitive is a fantastic thing. In other words, teams work together all the time. You come together with various skills and you're more competitive against other teams. Uh, collaboration without competition is collusion, which is a very dangerous thing. You, you, uh, you know, it's interesting to me, and, and I struggle with, with friends trying to understand when we talk about sports, no one questions the idea that it would be ridiculous if we all want the Indianapolis Colts to win the Super Bowl. You know, this is the World Cup for, for uh, Americans. And, but on the other hand, the way we could do that by simply saying no other teams could come to Indianapolis and play. The only play team that can play is our team. And we can play against much lesser teams, high schools or elementary schools, and I think we'd win. I mean, we'd win for years. But the challenge is we need to be in, the, in a marketplace where we can compete against others who are uh, of, a, of a high quality. And then the victory has meaning. Uh, Peyton Manning or whoever the, the famous player is of the day would never stay in a market where competition was eliminated, ever. They would immediately exit and go find a market where they could be in competition with the best. So the idea of collaboration makes all the sense in the world, but we often, when government gets involved, what they mean is collusion, meaning we are going to exclude all other players and we're going to work just with you. We've picked you. You're the one that we like. Everybody else loses. And there's something about that that's very, very concerning. I don't know, I don't have exactly exact figures concerning the uh, number of our graduates who find a job um, after finishing, uh, graduating my university. Uh, the problem I, I, I think is that uh, in the past, a big number, a big part of them did not find a job. Uh, so uh, in general, uh, the economic education in Romania, uh, university education, I mean, um, became depressed and now faces a lower demand from year to year. So we have uh, uh, less number of students from year to year. And I'm, I'm sure this is simply because they could not find a job after graduating the university. So there was a big imbalance between um, what we could provide and what the market desired. Uh, on the other hand, um, I, I, I know that some, at least some of my students work uh, in conditions or in uh, fulfilled jobs for which uh, they did not need to, to be trained in, in the university. I mean, like working in a call center. Um, and another, perhaps, uh, the thing that, that I want to, to, to clarify with you is that uh, speaking about private universities in Romania is a dangerous thing because people assume that there is something private in the universities. <laughs> well, there is nothing private here. Uh, starting with the simple fact that the owner, the persons who invented, who created the university, have no right over its capital uh, until the fact that we cannot, for example, uh, propose or set up a new uh, specialization, a new course, a new master degree, for instance, without getting a lot of approvals from the minister. So basically, even with this, I mean, the problem is not only that we need to apply and fill a lot of paperwork in order to get approvals for that. The problem is that the requirements are so absurd that after you uh, fulfill them, there, there is nothing else to do. I mean, let me give you just one example. We need to have 70% professors in our university, so Romanian professors working full-time in our university, 70% for any program of study. If I want to open an Austrian economics program, master degree or something, 
I need to have 70% of the teachers working full-time in my university, which practically prevents me from importing foreign scholars, from bringing foreign professors, or from hiring people simply for a, a single seminar or a couple of seminars, which practically prevents me from opening the program, in fact. So we are not a private university. We are heavily under the public control. Long live Mr. Fonerio. I think our time is, uh, is now out. Uh, you can certainly uh, talk to our speakers individually. Let's give them a, a big round of thank you. Ladies, I'll conclude and to just uh, tell you the last uh, feelings that uh, we, the organizer, are sharing with uh, all, all those present in this room. Uh, we've been very, very privileged to have such learned people uh, around the table. We've, great, we've learned today a great deal. And especially we, we've learned the fact that uh, uh, there is no cultural determinism that prevents us from talking to each other, each other. We have very, very different cultural backgrounds. We speak different languages. We, were, we, we, were, we grew up in different circumstances of life, from different geographies. But we can understand each other, which is, I think, a marvel, a miracle of what ex exchange and what trade of ideas can, can bring about. Uh, we've learned from Richard Rand that uh, the, the question, the, the problem of uh, sovereign debt, the sovereign debt crisis in Europe is not over. And we've also learned from him that, uh, from him that when it comes to European politicians, we should pay attention uh, to figures, not just to metaphors, because these figures, figures show that um, um, spending more than um, earning is not sustainable. From Barbara Kahn, can we, from Austria, uh, Austrian Economic Centers, Center, we've, uh, we've learned that European diversity should be cherished against this politically driven harmonization, pasteurization, uh, and homogenization. We've learned from Cornelio Berrar uh, that there are problematic, problematic, big and deep problematic aspects uh, of the regional policies and processes that take place in Europe today, and they all relate to the redistribution process. We've learned from Dr. Krasen Stanchev about the missed opportunities between, uh, of the relationship between Ukraine and the European Union. Uh, there were political mistakes which were done by the European politicians, especially their understanding of commerce, which led, un unfortunately, to the, um, to the uh, to the dramatic events in Kiev uh, uh, this, uh, earlier this year. Uh, we have also learned from Terry Anker about the importance of competition, the root cause of productivity, and from Bogdan Glavan we've learned that um, knowledge and human capital should be treated as, a human, uh, human, uh, as an economic good. Uh, finally, uh, we've learned from Radu Nekita uh, that uh, we, should, uh, we should make differences compatible and sh we should not go into the line of homogenization. All these great ideas um, were inspired by, uh, excellent, uh, by excellent chairpersons and um, all these ideas make us think how can we put them into practice. Ultimately, and this is known to you in this room, there are students of liberty but also people who want to engage in the in the, in the public forum, either as journalists or as politicians or as university professors, but they do want to engage. The question is how to do it. How can we uh, make Eastern Europe witness the miracles which happened already in the United States under Reagan's uh, presidency or in United Kingdom under uh, Margaret Thatcher's leadership? How can we see a, a Prime Minister in Europe again showing up, again the book of Constitution of Liberty, the book of Friedrich Hayek, and saying this is what we believe in? How can we see that happen again? Um, well, I believe we need uh, great ideas, and we have them, but we also need leadership. We need people who take up the courage to say what they believe to their constituencies, to their friends, uh, their colleagues, um, people who behave like street vendors, yeah, on the streets of our towns, we should, do, we should be, be doing that. And I'm very happy to, to learn that Barbara was also a politician sometime. So maybe we, we learn from you, from your experience, um, 
individually. This is very important. This is a meeting of, of think tanks, but also of uh, politically minded people who grew up under the, after the fall of communism. And one cannot underestimate what role, what consequences the existence, the very existence of um, Radio Free Europe had uh, for us, for our generation before 1989. I grew up listening together with my grandfather who was an anti-communist to Radio Free Europe. And of course it was subsidized by the State Department, but f fair enough, there were no podcasts in those days. Uh, so. I, I, I certainly uh, understand now, in retrospect, how much do we owe to you, uh, we, I mean the Romanians, but not just the Romanians, the Bulgarians and the Eastern Europeans. Uh, we owe you a great, uh, a great debt and um, I believe this sort of uh, exchange of ideas should continue. It's, it's our first experience of this sort for the New Republic and for the, new, uh, for the Republican Institu uh, Institute is the very first time that we host such such an event. Perhaps next time it will be better. I'm sure I'm an optimist, uh, uh, optimistic person just like um, uh, your colleagues. But this is uh, where we can start from. I'm uh, very confident that some important seed was planted today in your heart. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm very confident that people who are under 30 years old tonight, in 10 years from now, will carry the flag of freedom and will battle this uh, fight and will Help us win again uh, in this great cause, which is freedom. Thank you very much.